Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here. Uh, in case you're not aware, this is a uh, little retrospective mini-series I'm doing here on the seventh generation of game consoles. This is part three. Uh, part one was about the generation as a whole. Part two is about the Xbox 360. This will be about the PS3, and part four will be about the Wii. Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk about the history of the console a little bit, my personal take on it, you know, stuff like that. So if you're interested, stay tuned. Okay, so first... I'm going to talk about my experience with the console launch. Um, the console... Okay, so you have to understand that the 360 had come out a year before this thing. And I had learned from that that camping out for a console, which is what I ultimately did, uh, can be a lot of fun, but it also has a lot of problems. And uh, it's actually really hard to get a console that way. Uh, you have to get really, really lucky. Um, in the case of the 360, I had camped out at a Toys R Us, and I managed to only have to stay there for like 9 or 10 hours, which only, uh, because I guess no one ever thought to go to Toys R Us for this kind of thing, whereas all the Best Buys and Targets and Walmarts, etc. were packed. Um, so I just got really lucky that year. But the year after, I was like, I'm going to plan this a little bit better. So I pre-ordered one at a GameStop, and I have to be the only person who camped out for a fucking pre-order. <laughs> um... That was whatever, <laughs> but whatever, I got one that way. And you'd think that's where the story ends. No. Uh, I ended up getting three of them, and I'll explain. I swear I'll explain it. it <laughs> uh, so what I decided to do after that was I was like, okay, now that I have my pre-order and I've got one secured somewhere, I'm going to go and get these other two. So I got a buddy of mine to come with me, and we camped out at a Walmart uh, for two days, which sounds like hell. I realize that in the dead of winter, it's fucking cold, etc. But I, I planned a little bit better, you know? I bought these, like, badass sleeping bags that, to this day, I still use because they're just amazing. I got them at Walmart, you know, they were like eight bucks. Um, and they were so awesome. Um, you know, it basically became urban camping. It was a lot of fun. You know, there was actually this family in front of us that, uh, like, brought their own grill, and they were, like, uh, cooking all sorts of awesome stuff, and they had tons of it. So they were like, here, have some, have some, great, you know. It was a lot of fun. I had a really good time uh, when I camped out for these PS3s. Um, so that same weekend, the Wii was coming out, which is kind of impressive. Like, the two came out on the same weekend. And uh, I had basically... I'll tell more about this when I talk about the Wii, but I basically planned to stay there for all four days and get both. The reason I brought my friend is I wanted him to pick up one for me, and then I ended up with three of them, two of which I sold. I was one of those douchebags on eBay who's selling a thing for a really inflated price, but I made a shit ton of money. You know, like I, These things cost $600 when they came out, if you guys remember that. I think there was a $550 model as well for, that had 20 gigabytes in it and a few less features, but the 60 gigabytes cost... Uh, $600. And I sold two of them, I think it was like for two grand a piece. So that's a lot of money. So I made all my money back and then some, you know. Um, so I basically got the thing for free and made a bunch of cash. So that was why I did it. Didn't do that this generation because I didn't think it was going to work the same way. You know, in the post-2008 economy crash, the economic crash, it, it's not really the same environment. Like, I've seen people flipping PS3s or PS4s and Xbox Ones for like $50 profit as opposed to what I made, which was ridiculous. Of how that even happened, I still don't know. But, um, yeah, so once I had the console that I was keeping, you know, I brought it home and I thought, like, okay, well, this is cool. You know, it can play PS1 games, it can play PS2 games, and it can play PS3 games. If you guys remember, the launch ones are beasts. I hadn't bought any games at launch. And I kind of realized, like, I had nothing to do with it. You know, like, I didn't have any Blu-rays, which was a big thing they were pushing with it. Uh, I just had PS1 and PS2 games, and I played some of them on there, and that's kind of all I did with it for a while. Uh, there, it was actually funny. That same weekend that the Wii and the PS3 came out, Microsoft was like, we need to do something, you know, to kind of remind people that we have a console. So they did the weirdest promotion I've ever seen, and it was really successful, so I'm blown away that they haven't done another one of these. That same weekend, they launched, if you, if you went to Burger King in the U.S., they released Sneak King, Big Bumpin', and Pocket Bike Racer. Each of these was like $2. They were like 
you know, the, the kids meal type of toy thing. Yeah, but you could just straight up buy them if you wanted to. I swear to God, they were only like two or three bucks. It was it was really cool, and it was it's weird. Uh, they're very unique releases because they work on both the Xbox and the Xbox 360. And you're thinking like, oh well, it's the Xbox version and it plays it through backwards compatibility. No, it's two completely different builds of the game. And I felt very there was something fundamentally wrong about that. I remember coming home after the whole weekend when I had the Wii, I had the PS3, and I had these. I spent more time playing these than I did the other two, which I'll talk about a little bit more, but you see what I'm saying? Like, it was a weird launch because the PS3 had no games. That meme that we all kind of remember, hopefully, was true. There wasn't a whole lot to play on the PS3 other than multiplats that were inferior to their 360 versions. And it's not fanboyism. That's just how it is. That's, that was the case. And there's a lot of reasons for that. When I got the PS3, I mostly got it, when I get consoles right away, that's just how I am. But I mostly got it kind of thinking like, well, I'll get this thing to play exclusives on. I'm not going to, I've already got the 360, that's kind of my, my console of choice for the generation, that's kind of the direction I'm going, I'm having more fun on it. And... So I just went, okay, I'll wait until something comes along I want to play. You know, like a new Twisted Metal game, which we didn't get until, what, like two years ago? Uh, that took forever. So I, I really had nothing, I didn't have much to do with it, which was, it was a very disappointing purchase at first. And I understand now that I'm older why that was such a problem. The PlayStation 3 still has incredibly foreign architecture. If you don't know much about what Sony did with the PS3, they decided that... They made the mistake that every hardware manufacturer makes. The third console in every company's lifespan, pretty much, is a colossal fucking disaster. Uh, it almost always happens. It's very rare when they don't fuck up. And the reason that happens is usually arrogance. I'll give you some examples. Uh, Sega. I love them. All right? Sega is my all-time favorite. And they are probably the most guilty of this. Uh, you know, the Master System did fine. The Genesis did amazing. So then what do they do? They made the third console mistake, which was, what do you even call it? The Sega CD? Maybe. The 32X? Holy shit, that was a disaster. Or the Sega Saturn? Which one is their third? You could debate any one of them if you really wanted to. I would say that their next generation console was the Saturn. But any way you slice it, their third console was a huge mistake for a lot of different reasons. Usually it had to do with like, you know, just small mistakes like, uh, you know, marketing was terrible or the hardware was really hard to program for or, um, you know, too many power supplies. You know, like whatever it is, there's always some sort of mistake. Nintendo fucked up. Uh, this is going to sound strange, but hear me out. The N64, you know, it was their third console. Why is the N64 a fuck up? Because it used cartridges, which pissed off a lot of third-party developers, which is why a lot of the first, the, a lot of their favorite developers, uh, Square and a bunch of others, all jumped ship and said, we don't want to deal with cartridges anymore. They're too expensive. And they all jumped over to the Sony PlayStation and, in some cases, the Sega Saturn. And that's kind of what started Nintendo down their first-party exclusive path. Um, Microsoft just did it with the Xbox One, their third console. They decided... Man, we just kicked some, some fucking ass with the Xbox 360. Let's try fascism. It still blows my mind that they thought that was going to work. You know, the DRM shit. They did get rid of it, but now they're trailing. You know, they're kind of like, eh, sorry, we, we love you too, gamers. We didn't really mean to try to take away all your gaming rights. So they're trying to fix it. And Sony is just as guilty of this as well. Uh, Sony fucked up with the PS3 because the PS2 was so fucking successful. I never even really liked the PS2. It was my least favorite console of the sixth generation. Uh, I, the Dreamcast being my first, Xbox, GameCube, and then PlayStation 2. Whenever a multi-plat came about, I never wanted it on the PS2. I only wanted the PS2 for exclusive titles. That was my thinking going into the PlayStation 3, that I was going to use it mostly for exclusives. And... As it turns out, in a weird way, I ultimately was right, because what they got originally was this arrogant fucking $600 machine 
that actually cost them $900 to produce per unit, by the way. They lost almost $300 on every console sold. And of course you think like, well, how does that turn a profit? Well, that goes back to arrogance. Uh, when the PS2 was so goddamn successful, I mean, look, let's look at some numbers. Dreamcast, 10.6 million units sold worldwide. GameCube, 33 million. Xbox, like 34 or 35 million. PS2, 120 million. The logic going into the PS3 was, nobody can touch us. We're Sony PlayStation. Nothing, nothing can compete with us. And you can't blame them when you look at those numbers. All three of their competition consoles combined do not match what they sold. So they were thinking like, look, all the third party developers are gonna wanna work with us. Everyone's gonna buy our shit. That's just how it's gonna be. So they designed this console with really foreign architecture. We know it now as the cell. Uh, it's a very unique, I, I'm not a programmer or an engineer by any means, so I apologize if I'm getting the little terms here wrong, but it's very foreign architecture. You know, it's, it's a very unique thing to their system. Sony spent, it was a few billion dollars generating this thing uh, through R&D that they wanted to like use to replace PC hardware, like overall, like this was gonna be the thing that they put in everything. So it's gonna get standardized and brought across the board, kind of like they were hoping that Blu-ray just became the accepted dominant video format and media format for everything, which they ultimately got a little bit closer to down the line. But there was a lot of just, we're gonna make our own system and everything we do is going to be integrated with everything and we're going to have rights to all, everything. That was what they were thinking going into it. As well as, since everyone's going to buy our PS3, who gives a shit how much it costs, everyone's going to think, fuck the Wii, fuck the 360, get a PS3, it's the system to own. Since that's the case, if we have this really strange and weird foreign architecture in it, it's really hard to program for, it doesn't matter, because the third-party developers are gonna make our stuff, and they're gonna make it damn good. In fact, I remember reading an article at one point saying, part of the logic of the console was if they make the thing so hard to program for, third-party developers are gonna waste all their time and resources developing for it, and they'll be so burned out they will not be able to make games for the 360 or the Wii. That was, I'm not kidding, that was the logic going into it. We call that arrogance, because that's what it was. That was a bad fucking decision. As well as everything else they put in this thing. I mean, it's weird to think that when I say this thing is $600, it's not overpriced. It's actually significantly underpriced, because it includes an entire PlayStation 2. It includes... Uh, Blu-ray technology, which in 2006 is not even close to common, you know, like it was the cheapest Blu-ray player on the market. HDMI technology, which was, believe it or not, was pretty new. Uh, on the front, it's got memory card sticks, SD card ports, uh, CF card ports, you know, inside, it, as far as its operating system goes, it's capable of all sorts of amazing things. It's just, it's a, it's a battle tank of consoles. It's really quite impressive, honestly, from a technological standpoint. So at the time, there were no games. There was nothing I wanted to play on it. It wasn't interesting. And if there was a multiplat, usually the 360 version was better. And the reason it was better was because the, the ironically, because the architecture wasn't foreign. You know, it was basically PC architecture. And developers were like, look, people bought 360s and this thing's easy to make stuff for. So we're gonna put it on there. And if they did anything on the PS3, it was inferior because they were like, this is just too complicated. You know, and they weren't flying off the shelves. So down the line, they started, they basically got rid of Ken Kutaragi, who's the guy who basically developed the PlayStation 3. They kind of just threw him under the bus and said, like, look, we're going to change what he did as much as we can. So they started releasing older, uh, the, fat three, uh, the fat PS3, as we see here. Uh, they replaced, uh, they, they took out the four USB ports and put, just put two in. They got rid of all the card slots. They got rid of all the PS2 backwards compatibility. They tried emulation for a while but it didn't really work very well, and then eventually they got rid of it completely. Why, I don't know, because if it's just an emulator, even if it's mediocre, I'd still rather have it than not have it at all. But that's just my opinion. Um, they just tried to f find ways to cheapen this one. And then they started running into the same thing that 360 was running into, which was overheating issues. Because, I mean, it's just too much crap into one design, and it, it's not well ventilated. 
So, you know, this thing got a lot of yellow lights of death. Mine has not had it, but I don't ever really use it unless I really want to play a PS2 game in higher resolution, which was one of its best features. And that's, that's pretty awesome, but yeah. So they decided to eventually go with the slim model here, um, which is really when the PS3 started to take off more because, you know, Sony decided, okay, we fucked up. We made a lot of mistakes. We're going to try to forget this thing. We're going to try to forget the whole attitude we had with it. Because by the time they released this, people were saying Sony was done. You know, I remember that. In like, 09, you know, even 08, people were like, I don't think the PlayStation is coming back. You know, I mean, they didn't really, for a few years, it didn't have really anything anybody wanted to play. It was, I mean, what was the first one? It was Metal Gear Solid. And I remember everybody being like, the game was okay. And the biggest complaint they had were things like installing all of the data. That wasn't attractive to people. To have to pop in this game and let it install shit for like forever. Which was another problem with actually their architecture. You'll notice it, with the 360, you know, it doesn't, it downloads something, it doesn't have to install anything. Whereas this thing's architecture was so weird that it, you, know, you download it and then you have to install it separately. It's like two different things. It just takes a long time to get anything done. It chugs. You know, the operating system kind of chugs as a result. Like, it's interesting architecture, but that, that really hurt it. And it, it, the PS3 has not yielded a profit to Sony yet, because they spent so much money on R&D, even with 80 million units sold now. But it is amazing, truly amazing, that they were able to turn that console around the way they did. Because I actually really like the PlayStation 3 now, uh, I think now it's like the bastion of exclusive, mature, interesting titles uh, of, uh, well, I don't want to say current generation, but more recent generational stuff. Because the Xbox 360 is where I go for my multiplats, you know? And But it's, it's exclusive stuff for the most part doesn't really interest me. I don't care about Gears of War. I don't care about Halo. But um, I like a lot of the stuff that, that Sony's been doing with the PS3 in its, as far as exclusive titles go down the line. So there you go. <laughs> I do want to talk about some of the games I've got here. This is only two games, and I'll, I'll present them as, as to why I have them here. First one is Valkyria Chronicles. This is going to sound weird. I haven't played it. So why did I bring it out here? This is the first game I ever got for the PS3. Uh, the reason I haven't really played it is I'm not really into, like, turn-based RPG type of things, and that's really what this game seems to be from the small amount of time I played with it. Why'd you pick it up then? It was an exclusive title that Sega made. You have to understand, for the first couple of years, there really wasn't anything worth getting. And I was like, I've had this... I think I literally had a PS3 for a year and didn't own a game on it. And I'm sure you're thinking, like, why? Why wouldn't you just get something? Why wouldn't you return it? Why wouldn't you sell it? Whatever. I don't really get rid of my consoles. And I'm glad I didn't, because it's a very rare model now. And, like I said, there was just nothing on it I wanted. Like, I didn't need to get Call of Duty 3. You know, I already had it. <laughs> um, so I waited for an exclusive that would at least remotely capture my interest. And the only reason this one did was because Sega made it. That, that was really it. That was the extent of my thinking. Again, that was a long time ago, so whatever. And the game that I've actually played the most on this console, and it might surprise a lot of you, and actually I doubt there's anyone out there who would predict this, unless you've just been looking right down there. Back to the Future, the game. Uh, this was made by Telltale Games. It had a digital only release for a while, and then they released this physical copy, which I, I, I picked up like right away, because I was like, oh shit, I, I, you know, I really wanted to play it, and I don't support digital. And if you haven't played this, I highly, highly recommend it, provided you like uh, the Back to the Future series. This is essentially the fourth movie. As weird as that seems, this is actually the game I spent the most time with on the PS3. I've beaten it like three times, I think. I just, I really like this game, uh, mostly for its story, because the gameplay, it's a telltale game, you know, like Jurassic Park. It's carried by its story, which is really what captivated me with this game. And I think that Sony really went the right way with that. They took a lot of IPs, they like created a lot of IPs that are very story-centric now. Uh, mature story centric. Uh, granted, this wasn't made by them, but things like the Uncharted series, The Last of Us, you know, I respect them for doing that and for managing to salvage their console by doing stuff like that. And I, it's, it really is funny. You know, like I, I think I mentioned this 
in the 360 video, halfway through the 360's life, it went from being game-centric to being all-purpose. And it was around the time Don Matrick got there, the douchebag we all remember from E3 of 2013 who announced the fascist version of the Xbox One. Around the same time that he got there is around the same time that Sony went, look, we got to get rid of this philosophy and just try to go with this one. You know, they tried to go game-centric. It, and it worked for them. It brought them back. Like, that's, that's really what... I hope that these guys learn this. You know, being a game-centric game console tends to fucking work out. I know it's crazy, right? It's weird. Who would think that game-centric game consoles actually are good? But that is typically how it goes down. If you're looking to get a PS3, do it sooner rather than later. Probably, yeah, if you've never had one, or if you're thinking about upgrading, whatever the case may be, you'll want to pick one up probably by holiday season of 2014, uh, because eventually the servers for these consoles are going to go down. And if your game needs updates, like all of them do, <laughs> you know, or if it has free DLC or whatever the case might be, or there's DLC you actually really want and you want to pay for it, you got to do it. Because once the servers go down, you can't access that stuff. I mean, if it's already saved to your console, you should be fine, as long as your console continues to work. But if, you know, you need a patch for a game that you buy in 10 years, you're fucked. You know, like the game will run buggy and you're just going to have to suck it because <laughs> that's just how it is. Once the servers go down, it's done. So if you're thinking, no, 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 I'll pick up a PS3 in like 10 years at a Goodwill, you could, but your gaming experience will be much shittier for it. And that is one of the biggest complaints I have with the seventh generation overall is the dependence on DLC and patches. But I talked more about that in my first video in this mini-series. So, sorry about taking forever. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, please stay tuned to part four where I talk about the Wii. And I will see you all later.